Welcome to a special edition of Farrakhan Speaks, a roundtable discussion concerning the year 2012 and what was, and the year 2013 and what is to come, between the staff of the Final Call newspaper and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, from the historic Final Call Administration Building and Final Call Newspaper Office in Chicago. Greetings. I'm Richard Mohammed, Editor-in-Chief of the Final Call newspaper, and we're pleased and honored to have with us for an interview and a look at the year 2012 that has passed and what is to come in 2013 to have a great conversation and dialogue with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, our publisher, and the national representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. Brother Minister, first of all, Happy New Year. We're very pleased and honored to have you. And if you would like, we would like to get right into the questions for today. Let me say, uh, I pray that the new year will be happy. That's a tradition of this world. And the tradition of this world is to raise as much hell as you can as an old year goes out, make resolutions that you don't intend to fulfill or you won't fulfill, and engage in raucous behavior. We, uh, as Muslims, should not participate in such the new year may be happy, but it may not be happy. So we should wish for everyone God's peace in the new year, whether there are misfortunes that we might face which won't make it happy, but if God's peace is with us, then no matter what trial or circumstance comes up in the new year, that resolve with God will help us to get through. So I would like to say to our readers as well as to the public, the Bible says that the old world goes out with a great noise. And to symbolize how the old world is going to go out is the way this world lets the old year go out with lots of noise and frivolity and foolishness and decadence. For us, the new year and the old, as we are blessed by God to come through an old year. But so many people started this year, friends, family, persons that influenced our lives, and they said Happy New Year, not knowing that this year or last year would be their last year on this earth. So for me, it has always been a time of reflection. Reflection on those who started the year but were not blessed to finish it. Reflection on what we did or did not do, that we pray God will bless us to do better. New Year should be a time of deep reflection and commitment, praying that God will help us to go through this year and bring us safely into the next. 
So I appreciate your saying Happy New Year. But we are not the traditional people like that. We are a people that believe completely that today and tomorrow and the next day is not in our hands. So we hope and pray, inshallah, if it be the will of Allah, that we will have a great, uh, successful year for the spreading of that divine truth that will awaken our people and all who slumber under the touch of Satan. So thank you for your kind words in uh, introducing me. Well, Brother Minister, thank you for your wonderful answer. I, I would also like to add, participating in the, in the interview as well will be our assistant editor, Brother Ashad Muhammad, and our staff writer, Sister Starla Muhammad. So with your permission, I'd like to get to the first question. I'm honored to be questioned by the three of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I'd like to start, Brother Minister, on the cultural scene, if I may. Movies, music, and entertainment are, of course, America's number one export to the world. There's been a great clamor, a great discussion, a great deal of controversy about the movie uh, Django. I wanted to ask you, what are some of your thoughts about the movie? Do you think it's significant, or is it just entertainment? First, uh, the wicked king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, used music, art, culture, to dumb down the people so that they would not be mindful of how God was wreaking his wrath on Babylon. Art and culture, music, have a great role to play in any society. The great artists, the great musicians, the great people of culture, It's how you use what God has given you as a gift. It is unfortunate that what America exports to the world is a decadent culture that is affecting and infecting people throughout our planet. And that's why certain societies that are Islamic do not want any of America's culture. It's difficult to keep it away from young people all over the world. But to take our talented men and women and use them as sex symbols and to spread decadent filth to the world is part of a plot by Satan who is in control of America's music, art and culture and therefore to corrupt the talent that God gives and to use it to dumb down the American people and to dumb down the world's people and to make the youth of the world respond to decadence rather than respond to wisdom as their life is just starting, what kind of life will they have? So art and culture and movies and music has a great place. But the revolution of our thinking must be reflected in our art and our culture 
and the talent of our young people must always be used to lift the minds of those who are touched by our music, our song, our dance, our plays, our movies. And while I'm on that question, I want to say how grateful I am to Tyler Perry. He is probably one of the most brilliant young uh, entrepreneurs that we have. Why do I admire him? I have never seen his portrayal of Medea as a man cross-dressing. I saw his wonderful portrayal of Medea as bringing to the forefront the strongest person in the history of our sojourn in America, and that is Medea. That strong black woman who was the cornerstone of her family. She always was that figure that gave guidance, correction, reprimand, discipline. And Tyler Perry brought her to the screen in funny ways. But what I was seeing was the greatness of the strong black woman who saw us through from yesterday to today. Again, you know there are many sick people in America who have had very bad life experiences. And we don't have the blessing of being able to go to a psychologist or psychiatrist to help us handle our problems. But one of the great things that I saw with Imam W.D. Muhammad when he became leader of the then Nation of Islam, he brought to Chicago black psychologists, Naeem Akbar and others. And he wanted to use psychology and art to heal. It didn't come out probably as he would have liked, but when you look at Tyler Perry's uh, movies, you see the brilliance of T.D. Jakes, a spiritual giant. You see the majesty of human uh, problems acted out. So you could sit in the theater and see yourself in your madness, in your gladness, in your goodness, in your evil, and then come out of that experience for a $15 ticket and some popcorn and say, wow, I feel better. So this New Year's a shout out to the giant called Tyler Perry, a spiritual giant, a magnificent uh, human being. And I pray that this year his art, his greatness will shine even more in healing our people through mass projection of drama through film and plays. Having said that, Django. Yes, sir. I don't believe people make movies just to entertain. Wise people 
make movies to move people in certain directions. In 1970, after the Congress of African People, when the minister spoke and was given words to say by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and those words uh, caused me to be interviewed by the great brother Tony Brown on uh, his wonderful um, show. Um, and I was in Jamaica getting some rest after 15 years of work, seven days a week. And Elijah Muhammad sent me to Jamaica to get some sunshine and rest. And while I was there, Next to the Holiday Inn where I stayed was a beautiful resort called the Half Moon. And one of the great uh, black actors of the 20th century, uh, our brother, um, oh boy, a senior moment, <laughs> Brock Peters, was... Uh, making a movie in Jamaica called Lost in the Stars. And he told me when we met and had a wonderful exchange, he said the producer of the film said he would like to meet you. And he took me to the set where the movie was being made. And at a break, the uh, producer came out to meet me, or director. He was a Jewish man, and he said these words to me. He said, Farrakhan, you seem like a nice person. It's not you that we fear. It is your ideas. And then he said, there's a group of us that meet either on Fifth Avenue in New York or in Los Angeles, and we discuss trends. And if we see a trend that we disagree with, we utilize our skills, our talents, to begin to move the people in a direction that we feel is best. In that meeting that they have on Fifth Avenue in a penthouse or in California, he told me there are writers, script writers, book writers, artists, people that influence people. And once they decide on a trend, books will come out, movies will come out, plays will come out. Writers in newspapers will write because the Bible refers to the masses of the people as sheep. And one uh, word of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that we are easily said led in the wrong direction but hard to lead in the right. So Hollywood is not only entertainment but it's shepherding or guiding or influencing behavior. Having said that, let's look at Django in that light. Someone told me yesterday that the name Django really means uh, an awakened individual. A slave put to sleep 
awakened unchained what is the message that uh, mr tarantino is giving to black and white and what is in between the message is that django a black man who loved his woman his wife and was willing to do whatever it took to free her from the clutches of white people who were misusing her. That man awake, unchained, became a vengeful man who wanted to uh, wreak havoc on those who had enslaved not just his wife and him and and others on his plantation but he really wanted to see a people set free such a man was Nat Turner such a man was Gabriel Prasa, such a man was Toussaint, Louverture, Dessalines, Christophe. But none of those who rose up in Jamaica, in Antigua, in Brazil, were loved by the Tom. The Tom always saw those kind of people as a threat to their relationship with their slave masters and that which could get them hurt. So slave revolts that were written of in our recent final call on Christmas Day, those Toms told Massa what the blacks were planning and black people were slaughtered by the hundreds because Master wanted to make an example of such people. Django Unchained. The actors were absolutely superb. And the, the words that DiCaprio and other whites use, but mainly DiCaprio. Talking about old Ben and how Ben worked for his father and grandfather and he was mistreated. And DiCaprio wondered why didn't he rise up against his tormentors, his oppressors, his enslavers, his exploiters. Why didn't he rise? So he cuts the skull and opens it up and says to Django, your brains are made in a way that you're born to be a servant, born to love servitude. Huh? So now Django has already killed white people. Now he's in the place where his wife is. He's discovered. I thought that our brother uh, that played Tom to the max, Samuel Jackson, he played Uncle Tom so magnificently, even a modern Tom would feel ashamed to be that, looking at the way he played that part. And what Tarantino was showing that there's always somebody like that among us when we strive for true liberation. 
there's always somebody that loves closeness to the master, sitting with master with a drink and telling master, you know, you, you've been tricked by this Django. I know I'm taking a little time please, on please, that question, please go right ahead. but the question and, and the answers are so profound that when Django finally retrieves his wife and comes back to where she was and kills all the white people, all of them. And even the wife, I mean the sister of uh, uh, DiCaprio, who seemed to be somewhat gentle toward her slaves, she was blown away. Say goodbye to the mistress. And when you see Samuel L. Jackson shot in his kneecaps and he's cussing the freedom fighter, cussing the man who killed uh, his master. And you see the dynamite that he retrieved from white folk that he had dynamited the house. He knew what to do to destroy not just the master, but the mansion of the master. And when he goes out of that house, his wife is down at the end of the road. She knows what's about to go down. She puts her fingers in her ear. She's proud to see the house of master destroyed. What message does this send to black and white? I could have said it in one word. 9-11 was what the neoconservatives dreamed of when they said we needed another Pearl Harbor. They got it. Now the gun craze in America and 1,200 well-armed white militia. I got some facts this morning that there are over 300 million weapons among the American people, and the figures come up to 2009. Three more years of adding, and the assault rifles are going off the shelf, and some they will not be able to get for six months. There are no more assault rifles available now because after Barack Obama's re-election, after Newtown, the gun enthusiasts say, well, we better get what we need. Now, Michael Moore was looking at Django. And Michael Moore took a position that Americans are afraid. What are you afraid of? It's like a, a sinner always hearing the footsteps of the police behind them. So they're always looking over their shoulder. No slave master can be comfortable with an awakening slave. No slave master can rest easy because the slave now is becoming a problem in America. No jobs, no money. So you deal drugs to him, you deal guns to him. So he's a killer already, but he's insane in his killing. 
So Django Unchained might give direction to the bullets. Remember our mayor, he didn't tell them to stop shooting. He told them shoot straight because you're killing innocent children. And the alderman that I sat with said, as long as our murder and drugs and gang violence was contained and did not ill affect the broader community, they didn't really care if it went on. Well, after 9-11, America needs something else now because the guns of the militia may be directed at the government, but they're afraid of the rise of black men and women. So to me, when I saw the movie and came out, Sister Karima said a white lady came out in front of me with her husband. And she said to him, I won't be able to eat tonight. See? Now multiply that by the tens of thousands and the millions that will see the movie that are white. And multiply that by the tens of thousands of blacks that will see the movie and be encouraged to do what? Then the guns. 350 million of them turn. Seemed to me that the message in that movie was to stir white people to the nature of murder and stir black people to be unchained, awake, and deadly. It's a prescription, in my judgment, for race war. And if that is what is being planned by those who guide sheep-like people, I want to warn you. You're really planning the death of America as a nation under the wrath of God for the black man is no longer forsaken. I took time to answer that question because it was loaded with so much. I'll try to be shorter in some of my next responses. Brother Minister, please, we really want you to continue to give such great analysis, insight that you are doing. I wanted to continue in a different way, but kind of on the same thing. You mentioned guns, which of course is related to violence. We are seeing now the fratricidal violence in the black community. We are seeing instances, for example, in the killing of Trayvon Martin, Chavis Carter handcuffed in a police car that many feel was the targeting of black males. Then you have the 20 children shot to death in Newtown, Connecticut, and six adults killed as well. These incidents of violence, are they different? Are they related? What do you see happening? I see the society spinning out of control. You look in Greece, austerity measures, violence. You look in Spain, violence. You look in Italy, violence. You look in France and in the United Kingdom, violence. As the economy of the Western world begins to implode and collapse and people that have been used to getting the finer things in life cannot get them anymore, then you will find people becoming more and more angry with their governments, more and more desperate, and then you'll find the tendency toward revolt, revolution, anarchy. So um, 
That's uh, what I see uh, happening. But what we just witnessed um, last night, what was going on in the U.S. Senate, and what was going on and will be going on in the House of Representatives, giving us a, a two-month breather to continue madness. Those innocent children that were shot down in Newtown, the murderers of the children are in Congress right now. Why do I say murderers of a new generation of babies? Because if America and the leaders are too weak and cowardly to do what is necessary, then kicking the can down the road is sentencing babies in the future to the same violent death that we saw in Newtown. Either the president and the Congress must take on what is necessary to solve the problem. And the number one word is not just um, cutting the debt or cutting spending, raising taxes, the number one thing is, what are the American people ready to sacrifice in order to free future generations of what is going on now and will get worse in 2013? A culture of violence that will explode more in 2013 than in 2012, we're sorry to say. Brother Minister, thank you. I would like to come back to a political question a little later, but at this point I'd like to go to Brother Shad Muhammad, our assistant editor, and have him put some questions to you. Thank you, Brother Richard. Brother Minister, over the past year and a half, you've been particularly effective interacting with the youth via social networking, answering hundreds of questions submitted via your popular Twitter feed, and you've also spoken on numerous college campuses across the United States. Do you plan to continue and expand that outreach in the upcoming year? And secondly, what are the keys to survival for our young college students and the struggling historically black colleges and universities? I definitely plan, as long as God gives me life, to continue to speak to our young people in the colleges, the universities, and in the streets. And I want to continue, or we want to continue to encourage leaders and pastors that the church, the mosque, the synagogue is where those who believe they're saved are. The unsaved are in the streets. So our work is not in the mosque, it's not in the synagogue, it's not in the church, it's in the streets where the problems are. Now, the historically black colleges are suffering. They were the bedrock of the production of strong leadership in the 60s for the civil rights movement. Many of those who were the spark plugs of what happened in the 60s, their brilliance is in academia now. So the poetry of Haki Marabuti, the poetry of um, oh, my sister that's in Virginia Tech, 
Nikki Giovanni. Nikki Giovanni, the poetry of Sonia Sanchez. These are gifted, scholarly lovers of our people. They're doing a great job where they are because they're teaching young people and the young people that they're teaching hopefully will be better than the elders that are running things today. But to take our brilliant people from movement and stop movement toward liberation so much so that the colleges now are being taken over. They're being merged because they don't want to see an all black institution anymore because they don't want coming out of a black institution what they saw come out in the 60s. So what is the future of these black colleges and universities. Respectfully, we must be training young people not to look for a job, but to take those disciplines that will encourage their creative minds to come out and create a job. Steve Jobs, Gates, Zuckerberg, they didn't graduate from college. They went to college, but their creative minds caused them to do something that not only gave people jobs, but created now the means by which the masses of the planet are quickly awakening, escaping the controlled media by the elite and oligarchs of the world. So the black colleges and universities must realize that we are in a time period where we must prepare ourselves to do something for ourselves and prepare ourselves to build a nation and a world that suffices our needs. So little subject matter that gives you a degree that means nothing is unacceptable. We must challenge ourselves in these colleges and not let the so-called advisors who are misadvisors take you out of meaningful disciplines that can help you to carve out a future for yourself and your people and put you into disciplines that are easier for you to attain your degree with a C average. So I intend to continue to be in these colleges and universities warning our young people that the time is now that we should not depend on white America to do for us what we must qualify ourselves to do for ourselves. Okay. My next question, Brother Minister, deals with international affairs. You've always spoken honestly and courageously regarding the hidden realities of America's foreign policies. You've discussed the unintended consequences of the so-called Arab Spring, the continued efforts aimed at regime change in Syria, and as for Iran, the saber rattling and um, continued drum beats for war. How are we to view these global realities these global events, and what is the responsibility of the American people to speak out against these things that are done by the government in their name? The American people need to be awakened. If the American people really understood how evil their government and its policies have been toward people not only outside of America, but inside America, they would awaken. And out of them would come a patriot who will speak 
truth to power to free their minds from the manipulation of those who are in positions of authority and power but are corrupted to the core by the moneyed special interests that govern the governors govern the senators govern the government of the United States of America but Everything that is being done is moving the world toward the most dreaded of all wars, the war of Armageddon. And the wicked and the warmongers and war makers and mischief makers will be set down in a brand new world with brand new leadership that are rooted in principles of freedom, justice, equality, and peace will be the leaders of tomorrow. Let's prepare them today. Thank you very much, Brother Shout. At this point, Brother Minister, we would like to now have Sister Starla Muhammad, our staff writer, ask you some questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Brother Minister, what are your thoughts on the current state of black leadership? What do black leaders, groups, and organizations need to do to eradicate the roadblocks and impediments that seem to prohibit them from working together for the benefit of the masses of our people in 2013 and beyond? The black leadership is committed to an America that accepts us, an America that they can encourage to make a way for us, an America that would allow the income gap between black and white to close, an America that is post-racial. I don't find fault with them. These are brilliant men and women in a direction that we as Muslims, followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, believe is fruitless. They won't know that until they run into the reality that 2013, 2014, and 2015 is going to teach them. Then they will turn, as the Bible teaches, the uh, son of man, you know, went to these dry bones. He spoke the word to them. But the word only caused them to shake and rattle. But they never stood up in unity because the spirit of God was not in them. So the son of man went back to his sender, disappointed that they had not come up. And the sender said to the son of man, prophesy unto the winds and let these winds blow on these slain of God. The winds are blowing. And they're getting up to what one might call in a tornado or hurricane, five. And as these winds blow, the bones are forced to come together. And I believe the scriptures that we are going to stand up an exceedingly great army and then we will know that God, the Savior, is among us to make us again into a great people. Just be patient. It's all coming where God wants it to go. 
Yes, sir. Thank you. My next question, Brother Minister, what guidance and practical advice would you give black women who are single, have sons, and the father is not part of the child's life? How can women effectively raise and guide these young boys into responsible manhood? How can women ensure that they are guiding but not babying their sons? Be like my dear. I didn't have a father in my house. My mother was strong enough to be anybody's father. We've got strong black women, but if they sit around watching stupid television, if they watch that which makes them feel that their power is in sex rather than in the brilliance of their minds and their deep spiritual connection to God, that was Medea, that was grandma, that was the hands of grandma that helped the children, that produced children to rock that cradle well. And so black women need to stop thinking that you necessarily need a weak man in your house. You just need to rise up and take strength like Hagar. As a Muslim, when we go to Mecca, we run between the hills uh, following Hagar's path. She was running, looking to where? The hills for help. In the Psalms of David, he said he would look to the hills. But then there's a question, from whence cometh my help? It wasn't coming from the hills. My help cometh from the Lord. Strong black women, moral black women, women who will remain chaste, keeping their hands in God's hands while we work to make a man for them and become real men for them. But the enemy is afraid of any black man that will be strong enough to swim against the tide of weak men weak leadership. They weak work to destroy strong men so that black women have no man to look up to except the slave master's children. Wrong again. God is making men today. As he made men in the beginning, he has to make a man today and many men. So we've got to double our work cleaning up the ghetto, getting our men up and moving. We've got to strengthen our men and hold our women in check in the sense that they don't give up hope on us. You're strong enough to make a man. My mother was, and all she had was God and his Christ as a Christian woman and the discipline that she put on me and my brother. And I didn't turn out too bad for black people. I may have been a hell of a thing for the enemy of black people. Thank you, Mom. Thank you. Look, Minister, our time is just steadily getting away. We probably have about nine minutes. What I'd like to do is to get in two questions and hopefully well, I'd like to get in two questions, and then in any remaining time, I'd like to have you close in any way that you choose. First question comes from our senior editor, Brother Askia Muhammad, longtime respected journalist from Washington, D.C. His question is, do you believe President Obama will try to live up to the promise of his dream in his second term, or will he just continue to capitulate to the powerful interests with which he surrounded himself in his first term. I believe that our brother will try, but he will be overwhelmed by the forces. And if he doesn't bend to those forces, they'll find a way to make sure that he doesn't fulfill four more years. This will be my final question and 
Minister Farrakhan, we're here in the final call building, which is uh, the first permanent home as you rebuilt the work of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we're having this wonderful interview. But you, are also, you, have, you have also been here doing an additional work, producing a series of messages that we expect to see in this new year the time and what must be done. We've got about five minutes left. Can you, would you please share something of that series in whatever way that you wish, what it means, the title, but in any way. And thank you very much for the interview. It's a privilege to be here at the Final Call building where it began for us in our first real home. I'm privileged to be here where our first great editor, Wali Muhammad, championed the message of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, an uncompromising giant. And coming behind him, you all have picked up the baton from that great brother and are carrying it on. And I believe that if he were here, he would be as proud of you all as I am. Now, having said that, we intend for the next uh, 52 weeks to deal with the subject that was given by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the time and what must be done. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad finished his time among us with a series of lectures called The Theology of Time. And we, in this time, want our people to understand that time is the yardstick that judges our actions. Imagine a silly farmer that doesn't know the season and plants a crop out of season. Why, he's not a farmer, he's a fool. If we understand that we are supposed to be free men and women, then we must not act as slaves. That, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught me, is not good subject and verb agreement. We are in the present and our actions should not be of the past mentality of a slave who sits around begging others, gimme, 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 gimme. No, I'm free now. Let me do something for myself, but you should help us because we gave you all that we had. 310 years of chattel slavery, 150 years as a free slave. We built the economy of the South. <clears throat> that fueled the Industrial Revolution of the North. We fought in every war that America has had, not for our freedom, but for America's freedom and for the freedom of others who came to America and found the American dream and built it on the nightmare of black existence. So no, it's time now for the black man and woman to realize it's on us to make a future for ourselves and our children and our unborn generations. And I will be doing everything I can in this year to provide that guidance. But I am telling you, as the Quran says, by the time, surely man is in loss except those who believe and do good and enjoin one another to truth and enjoin one another to patience. The time will judge our actions and if our actions are not correspondent to the time, 
we will continue down the road of intense regret over great loss. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for this hour. And may God continue to bless the final call to be the voice of our people and freeing the minds of any who would read because of your brilliance, your writings, your editorials, and your pursuit of real news in real time. Thank you, sir. Brothers and sisters, we're very happy to announce that our beloved Minister Louis Farrakhan is launching a timely and life-saving 52-week series of talks entitled The Time and What Must Be Done. Log on every Saturday, 6 p.m. Central Time for truth, guidance, and unequaled love from the National Representative of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Pass on the word every Saturday at 6 p.m. Central Time at NOI.org. The time and what must be done.